Hi everyone, my name is Holly Campbell. I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator at EcoSpark and today I'm going to lead you through an aquatics webinar. In this webinar, we're going to learn about watersheds, their main components, and how we can assess the health using small aquatic bugs called benthic macroinvertebrates. I'm just going to shut my video off here now so that you can see the slides better. So before we dive into everything, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of EcoSpark and who we are. EcoSpark was formed as a citizen science group about 24 years ago by three University of Toronto professors who wanted to ensure that environmental monitoring, data collection, and environmental stewardship remained active despite severe government cutbacks in these areas. Our group evolved into a nonprofit organization in 2000, and today EcoSpark runs a number of environmental education programs in schools and communities throughout the greater Toronto area. Our mission, Discover Act Change, exposes students and teachers to local outdoor and environmental education opportunities that connect in-class concepts to real life examples. We deliver hands-on environmental workshops that inspire students to become more environmentally, civically and socially engaged individuals, increasing, and increasing environmental literacy. So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land determined by topography from which all surface water such as rain, snow, and runoff drain into the same place. Whether it's a creek, stream, river, lake, or ocean, the high elevation level levels is what dictates the direction in which the water will flow. So we are in a watershed right now. In Canada, there are five, five main ocean watersheds, also known as, as drainage basins. The Atlantic, which can be divided into the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence, the Arctic, the Gulf of Mexico, the Hudson Bay, and the Pacific watershed. Ontario is located within the Atlantic watershed, specifically the Great Lakes Basin, and, and according to Canadian Geographic, it is home to 25% of Canada's population, containing nearly 21% of our planet's fresh water. In Ontario, there are roughly 36 conservation authorities that partner with landowners and government and other organizations to manage and protect our watersheds and natural resources. Watersheds are an essential part of our lives and help maintain the health of our natural world. There are several different types of aquatic ecosystems that can be found within a watershed. We can break these down into two main categories, lotic and lenthic. Lotic systems such as rivers, streams, and springs contain flowing or moving water, where lenthic systems such as lakes, ponds, or wetlands are systems with little to no water movement. Due to the lack of water flow, lenthic systems tend to be warmer than lotic systems. In addition, dissolved oxygen levels in lenthic systems are generally lower which can have a negative impact on aquatic life. Let's take a look at some of these systems closer. So let's first look at streams and rivers. Streams are smaller and feed into rivers. Their substrate is generally composed of stones, rocks, pebbles, and some silt in areas where the water current is weaker. Organic matter doesn't typically accumulate in any great extent since it is consistently washed downstream. Streams tend to be cooler than rivers and therefore will contain more dissolved oxygen. Aquatic bugs found in streams, especially those with strong currents, often have certain features such as hooks, like the kind of fly you can see up in the top corner, or suction cup-like mechanisms, like our black fly larval friend there, that help them attach to rock surfaces so that they aren't consistently being washed downstream after heavy rains. Rivers are larger and, all, and obtain all discharge material from streams. There are many different types of rivers, all varying in depths, widths, and currents. Depending on the current, the substrate may resemble that of streams or that of lakes. Rivers with slow currents may have organic matter and silt as their substrate and may even have orga organisms normally found in still water. Wetlands. A wetland is an area of land that is either covered or saturated with water permanently or seasonally. Whether it's covered by shallow water or has the water table close to a surface, these systems provide valuable ecological surfaces, such, services such as habitat for wildlife, flood control, and aid in water purification. In Ontario, there are four major types of wetlands, marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens that can be characterized by their distinctive plants and animal communities. Marshes are wetlands that are covered by standing or very slow moving water. Some marshes experience loss of surface water during dry seasons. However, their soil and root base of the plants are always saturated year round. 
Out of the four types of wetlands mentioned, marshes are one of the most diverse, supporting abundant plant and animal life. They are very rich in nutrients and are the most productive wetlands in Ontario, or the most productive types of wetlands in Ontario. Swamps, essentially wooden marshes, are waterlogged areas supporting trees, tall, tall shrubs, herbs, and mosses. They support a combination of aquatic and terrestrial animals and can periodically flood with snow, melt, and spring rain. They can also become dry towards the end of the summer. Since some swamps do dry out, they typically lack true aquatic plants. Bogs and fens. So bogs are typically found in northern regions and are permanently flooded, fed by precipitation. They have poor drainage and the most predominant vegetation is moss. Bogs accumulate dead plant material, which then form a type of soil known as peat. Typically, bogs are too acidic to support animal life. Fens are similar to bogs, except the fact that they have better drainage and accumulate less peat. They are also less acidic, therefore can support more plant and animal life. So why should we care about watershed health? Healthy watersheds affect the quality and life for humans and the environment overall. All water in a watershed shares the same fate as it flows from headwaters or upstream to downstream. If upstream waters are impacted by pollution or land use practices such as agriculture, runoff, erosion, or untreated sewers, those impacts will eventually flow downstream affecting everything that uses this water. Watersheds provide invaluable resources such as drinking water, recreation, food, livelihoods, and habitat for wildlife and plants. They are also home to ecologically significant ecosystems such as coastal sand dunes and marshes. Interesting fact that in Ontario, um, or the GTA specifically, all of the watersheds in the Greater Toronto Area flow into Lake Ontario, and that is where we get our drinking water from. So if there is an issue that happens upstream, it'll eventually flow downstream, accumulating everything and affecting our drinking water. Humans have an impact on watershed health um, in several different ways. Uh, we can negatively impact watersheds, whether it's fertilizers from our fr farms or golf courses that add additional nutrients such as nitrogen or phosphorus to our waterways. These excess nutrients uh, can cause eutrophication, which results in algal blooms and less oxygen for fish and other organisms. Storm water runoff, uh, such as chemicals and salts that are unable to be soaked up by the ground, um, such that are unable to be soaked up the ground, wash off of our roads or other paved surfaces and are directly carried into our water systems. Dams decrease flow, inhibit animal dispersal and migration, and can also decrease dissolved oxygen levels, littering, or improper disposal of chemi chemicals, such as pouring them down the drain, can mean that these substances go untreated before entering our water system, and construction and development can disturb soils and increase erosion. So it is important to monitor the health of our aquatic ecosystems. Sometimes it's not easy to tell whether or not a water body is polluted by the way it looks or smells, but most of the time those things don't necessarily help us. Uh, which is why we need to use physical, chemical, and biological tests to assess water quality. So even though a stream may appear healthy by the way it looks, or unhealthy by the way it smells, we still need to do additional tests in order to be sure. So benthic macroinvertebrates, I've mentioned these guys earlier. So they're small aquatic bugs visible by the naked eye that lack a spine or backbone that can be found at the bottom of our streams, rivers, and lakes, any water bodies. BMIs are extremely useful when it comes to assessing water quality for several different reasons. Um, since they have varying tolerance levels to pollution, what you find, and what kind of bugs you find, can tell you how clean or polluted the water is. Some BMIs are very sensitive to pollution, like our stone flies, and can only live in clean water, while other BMIs, such as worms or sow bugs, are tolerant to pollution and can live in clean or polluted water. And one thing to note is that those that are sensitive to pollution, you are not gonna find them in those polluted waters. And like I mentioned earlier, 
species that can tolerate more polluted waters are able to live in either conditions. Um, finding high diversity and high abundance of VMIs, including those that are sensitive in a sample to pollution, often suggests that the water quality is quite healthy. VMIs live sedentary lives. As a result of this, VMIs can reveal long-term cumulative effects pollution may have had on ecosystems. VMIs are easy to sample and they are abundant in most aquatic ecosystems. They play a key role in the food chain as they are an important source of food for fish. Lastly, protocols and methods used to collect VMIs to assess water quality are standardized, allowing for easy comparison between sampling sites. I'm going to share EcoSpark's standardized sampling protocol video, video with you now so you can visualize how we collect and process BMIs to assess the water quality in our watersheds. EcoSpark is an organization that empowers people to take an active role in protecting and sustaining their local environment. In this teacher training video, we will review EcoSpark's Changing Currents Water Quality Monitoring Protocol on how to conduct a stream study. Changing Currents program is a hands-on educational program that helps you and your students make the curriculum come to life through the exploration of your local river or stream. EcoSpark follows a scientific protocol to collect benthic macroinvertebrates, which are small aquatic bugs visible by the naked eye that lack a backbone that can be found at the bottom of the stream. These BMIs have different tolerance levels to pollution. Depending on the abundance and diversity of the BMIs found, we can gain a better understanding of how well the stream is doing. In this section, we'll be covering how to choose a site and mapping your transects for your stream study. When choosing a site for your stream study, you want to find a site with at least a 40 meter stretch and a width of three meters that contains a riffle, a section with fast moving water, and a pool, an area with slow moving water that is safe and accessible for you and your students. Once a suitable and safe site has been identified, you can record your GPS coordinates and begin to map your transects. To determine the number of transects needed, measure the most narrow width of the stream using the diagram to help determine the number of transects required. In our sample, the stream is three meters wide and therefore requires five transects. When determining the spacing between transects, you take the site length, you divide it by the number of transects required minus one to get the distance needed between each transect. This diagram shows a sampling site with five transects for a site length of 40 meters with 10 meters in between each transect. Once the correct number of transects have been identified, use flagging tape to tie on nearby shrubs or plants along the stream bank to identify each transect. Use a measuring tape to measure the correct distance in between each transect. When collecting your sample, you always want to start at your most downstream transect and work your way upstream. For this role, Two people in waders will enter the water. One person will hold the net facing upstream, closest to the shoreline they entered, where the other person will get in front of the net as the kicker or the dancer. Their role is to kick the substrate in front of the net for 10 to 15 seconds. This will loosen the bugs, flowing them into the net. Once complete, the net holder will move the net one net length across. Repeat this process until you reach the other bank. So once you've made it to the shoreline, the net holder will carefully scoop the net upstream. This will ensure that they don't lose any of their sample. Once you've reached the shoreline you started on, the rest of your group members will be waiting there for you with a bucket, sieve, and rinse bottles for transferring the sample. Carefully empty your D-net into your sieve, folding it on its side over your bucket. First, rinse the outside of the net, making sure all of the bugs fall into the sieve. Then turn it inside out and rinse the inside with the spurt bottles. Once the inside of the net has been rinsed clean, place the net aside. Our next step is to rinse any sediment remaining in the sieve. Use the spurt bottles to rinse the sieve until the water below runs clear. Next, transfer the contents of the sieve into the class bucket. To do this, 
turn the sieve upside down, use the rinse bottles to wash your sample into the class bucket. The class bucket is where all the samples from each transect are pooled together for the study. In addition to our sampling protocol, we also collect physical and chemical data, such as turbidity, pH, temperature, and other chemical parameters to assess water quality. Now that the sample has been transferred into the class bucket, we'll move on to sorting and identifying our benthic macroinvertebrates. In order to sort and identify the bugs, we'll need the following equipment. Hand lenses, pipettes, tweezers, ice cube trays, white bins, and BMI ID guides. Using a measuring cup, we'll scoop a subsample from the class bucket into each bin. Looking carefully at the trays, try to pick out everything that you see that moves. The rule is if it moves, pick it out. Use the pipettes to pick out the smaller bugs and use the tweezers to pick out the larger ones. Transfer the bugs into ice cube trays and try to sort them out according to groups. Sort the bugs that look alike into the same compartments. For our protocol, the goal is to find 100 bugs which will make it a valid stream study. Students can refer to EcoSparks ID resources to help them identify their bugs. Once all the bugs have been sorted, EcoSparks certified staff will help ID and tally the bugs. Once EcoSparks staff have tallied the bugs, the study will conclude with a wrap-up discussion to assess the health of the stream using the data collected. So that was a quick overview of our changing currents protocol. Um, just like collecting benthic data, physical data is just as important. Certain features about your sampling site can provide insight on why you may have only found uh, BMIs with high to tolerance levels to pollution or vice versa. Riparian vegetation is key to stream health as it, as it provides habitat and can stabilize banks preventing erosion and reducing the amount of runoff or nutrients entering our streams. Substrate materials refer refer to the rocks, pebbles, soil, and sand found at the bottom of our stream beds. The different types of substrates can provide habitat for different BMIs. Overhead canopy refers to the amount of shade provided by trees that helps keep the streams cool. And identifying site observations like wildlife, water levels, pollution sources such as nearby parking lots, development, farmland, litter, or invasive species can help raise red flags and identify trouble areas in need of stewardship. In addition to physical data, we collect water chemistry. Uh, there are a number of parameters that we look at when assessing a site. Temperature um, is key. All aquatic species do best in certain types of temperature ranges. Quick changes in water temperature can cause stress in animals and unnaturally warm waters can spread disease and decrease oxygen levels. Nearby pollution sources can be a cause of unnaturally warm waters. Ideal temperatures for water in Canada are between two and 20 degrees. Turbidity measures the clarity of the water. The more turbid the water, the less life it can support. If we have excess nutrients coming into the stream, making our water cloudy, um, that excess nutrients can also have an impact on the amount of available oxygen that's in the stream. pH measures how acidic or alkaline the water is on a scale from zero to 14. Zero being acidic, seven being neutral like our drinking water, and 14 being more alkaline or basic. Most aquatic plants survive in a range from 6.5 to eight, so kind of that neutral area. Dissolved oxygen. All plants and animals need oxygen dissolved in the water in order to survive and breathe. Streams with higher levels of dissolved oxygen will support more life than those with lower. Conductivity is the measurement of water's ability to conduct, elect, conduct electricity. When salts and other inorganic chemicals, such as nitrates, phosphates, dissolve in the water, they break into tiny electrically charged particles called ions, which increase water's ability to conduct electricity. Recorded in micro or millisiemens per centimeter, a safe range for freshwater ecosystems is less than 300 micro siemens. Salinity is a measurement of dissolved salt content in the water. Increases in salinity are caused by salt or oil runoff. Salts used on roads, parking lots, sidewalk, or sidewalks in the winter end up into the streams and rivers. All these paved surfaces are unable to absorb them and that's why they flow into our streams. Increases in salinity and conductivity levels uh, in aquatic ecosystems tend to increase after uh, after winter and snow has melted. Uh, this is 
For salinity, we record it in parts per thousand or parts per million. A safe range for freshwater ecosystems is less than 0 0.5 parts per thousand. Anything over uh, 1.0 parts per thousand and some aquatic organisms are no longer able to survive. Uh, for example, salt water systems, the salinity levels in there are about uh, 2.0 parts per thousand. Total dissolved solids are basically is the measurement of the combined total of organic and inorganic substances contained in a liquid. High total dissolved solids or TDS levels are ca caused by large amounts of suspended solids, including minerals, plants, plant materials, silt, clay, industrial and agricultural waste, and sewage discharge. We record total dissolved solids in parts per thousand or parts per million. A safe range for freshwater ecosystems, anywhere between 50 and 250 uh, parts per million or 0 0.05 to 0 0.25 parts per thousand. So now that we've got a little bit of a background and some knowledge about our benthics and our sampling, we're going to take a quick look at one of EcoSpark's sampling sites in Toronto. So EcoSpark has been sampling the Humber River at Etrulay Park for several years now. For this example, we're going to look at data collected in August of 2019, so data from last summer. Looking at this picture, the water flows downstream towards the bridge. If we were to stand in the river, the right bank would be the one on the far side with the apartment buildings, and the left bank would be the one closest to us with the walking trail. When looking at the riparian vegetation um, on the right bank, you can see some metal-like grasses adjacent to the stream. As you move further back, there appears to be some smaller shrubs and some trees. On the left side, this bank, the, le uh, the side closest to us, adjacent to the stream, you will notice tall grasses and meadow species, but as you move back, in case closer to us, you'll notice that the grasses have been mowed and that there's a walking trail nearby. Where this picture was actually taken, um, it, the person is standing in the parking lot. One thing to keep in mind is that vegetation like trees, shrubs, and tall grasses are able to stabilize the banks better with the roots to prevent erosion or slow down the runoff compared to mowed grasses, gravel, or paved surfaces where runoff would easily wash away into the river during heavy rains. In terms of canopy cover, as you can see from this image, there isn't a lot of canopy cover shading the river. Looking at the substrate, which is hard for you guys to see in this picture, but from a personal experience, I know that the substrate material for this site kind of a mix of some larger rocks and smaller rocks about gravel size and sand and silt. So let's go to the next slide and here we can see a Google Earth view. It provides an overview of the lands surrounding the Humber River sampling site. I've highlighted a few things here in white. Um, some of those that you can see are buildings um, on our right side and how small the riparian vegetation really is on that side. So when we're down at the stream, it might look like the vegetation goes on for a while, but when we take step back and take this aerial view, we can see that there really isn't that much vegetation on our right bank there. I've also highlighted the bridge and the road that cuts across our river, the nearby parking lot, walking trail, and the dam upstream. There are several different sources of pollution that impact the health of the water quality of the Humber River in one or more ways that you can see here. For example, we talked earlier about salinity levels. Uh, we have our bridge and our road. Uh, when we use road salts to help improve the driving conditions, it, does, it helps us in the short term, but as that snow melts, all of the salt enters our stream and increases those salinity levels, as I mentioned, negatively impacting our benthics and the fish communities, not only in that specific area, but also as the water flows downstream. Oils from our cars, chemicals, and pesticides that might be used on the grass or just the mowing equipment, garbage that might not be properly disposed of by pedestrians using the trail or the park can all enter the river and have an impact, creating problems for the downstream, downstream and the habitats and animals that live there. One thing to note is that all of our watersheds, like I mentioned again, flow into Lake Ontario and it's important to understand that the actions and the pollutions that might happen upstream will have a negative impact on downstream. Again, that is where we get our drinking water from. Um, 
And the more that we can do to help protect and restore these areas, the less our treatment plants have to work in order to filter all of the, these pollutions that are entering into our drinking source here. So based on what we've seen so far, there are some features that impact the health of our site. EcoSpark staff collected the following chemical data that you see in front of you. Although our turbidity result was positive, the majority of the other chemistry results were poor or fair, indicating that the site is potentially or possibly impaired. So let's see what the benthics had to say about our water quality. When sampling uh, BMIs or benthic macroinvertebrates, um, to assess water quality health, we look at 27 different taxa. High diversity and high abundance of BMIs is a great indication of health. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, it is unlikely that you'll find all 27 taxa in the same stream as BMIs have those different tolerance levels to pollution and they, and they vary and so do different site conditions. However, 12 different taxa groups found in a specific site is a good sign of diversity. In this study, we found a total of 106 BMIs uh, from 12 different groups, showing that that is a good sign of diversity. On the slide, you will notice that I have highlighted each BMI's background, ranging from red being the most tolerant to pollution to green being the least or most sensitive to pollution. Unfortunately, you'll see on the screen that we did find one unknown and we were unable to identify it, therefore we were unable to give it a rating. Looking at the slide, you can see that the majority of the BMI's found had a fair tolerance to pollution, so the red and the orange backgrounds there, but there are less sensitive species found. Our sensitive species here were the helgramate, um, also known as fish flies or other flies, and the caddis fly there. Based on this, I would agree with our chemistry results and that the stream is potentially or possibly uh, impaired, but to be certain, we can compare, we can confirm our hypothesis by using EcoSpark data analysis tool. Because this is a presentation, I've taken the liberty to capture a screenshot of our data calculator here. Um, this data calculator can be found on our EcoSpark website in case you want to enter the values in yourself to be able to get this rating. So when using Benthic to assess water quality, there are several different indices to consider, such as the percentage and number of different taxa groups found in a sample. Uh, we refer to these as our main ones, the Hilson Hall Biotic Index, HBI, and Benthic Aggregate Assessment, BAA. The HBI uses regional tolerance levels and numbers for each taxonomic group of benthics that were found in our sample. A value of six or higher is of concern with this index. Finally, the BAA, which takes an aggregate of all 10 indices found on the screen that you can see here, for our final determination, as it is a more robust method for determining the overall results of the analysis. If five or more of the indices do not indicate unimpaired, then the site condition is reported as potentially or possi possibly impaired. As you can see, our guess was correct. The river is potentially impaired as a result of our analysis and the BMIs that we found. So, how can we improve water quality? There are several things that we can do to protect and maintain and restore the health of our watersheds. For example, restoring habitats through planting native trees, shrubs, and grasses, especially around water bodies, can help improve the riparian vegetation, aiding in filtering of ground and surface water, and help shade and cool those different water bodies. Creating or restoring wetlands can help reduce flooding, um, also cleaning up litter and properly disposing of chemicals is something that everyone can do on an individual level, or even simpler acts such as using natural or environmentally friendly products like reusable containers, bottles, water bottles, um, usable straws, natural cleaning supplies. In addition, taking public transport or just turning the tap off when you're brushing your teeth or taking shorter water or taking shorter showers to reduce your water consumption are all things that can help. If you're looking for more to do, you can even write to your local MP about a particular water issue that you are concerned about, educate others through campaigns or school assemblies as well. There are so many different ways that you can get involved, even by connecting with uh, your local conservation authorities. They always have opportunities and are looking for volunteers um, to help protect and restore uh, the different watersheds. So again, whether it's on an individual, community, or global level, everyone can do something to give back. We are all in this together, so every action 
uh, is important to maintaining the health of our watersheds. So I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to watch this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to contact EcoSpark um, either on our website or using the contact information that you see on the screen. I hope everyone has a great day and thank you once again.